Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you, Living River? Amen. We thank God for each and every one of you that are here today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Certainly glad to uh, be here with you. <clears throat> Pastor Robert Hillman of Living River Family Worship Center. Amen. If you would be so kind as to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8, <clears throat> excuse me, John chapter 8, verse 32, John chapter 8, verse 32, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, John chapter 8, verse 32, and Ephesians chapter 5, as I heard one preacher say, Ephesians, <laughs> hallelujah, um, <clears throat> John Chapter 8, verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Or as we discovered in one particular version, the truth that you embrace shall make you free. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, and it reads as thus. For ye were sometimes darkness, or in darkness. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Amen. Um <clears throat> We are uh, yet in the series that we've been doing. I didn't even know that it was going to go three weeks. Uh, this may be the conclusion of it, not because we are done, but because I think that there are some things that the Lord uh, also wants to say concerning another subject that we'll be talking with you about real soon. But we've been talking for the last few weeks about how knowing truth or knowing the truth brings freedom. Amen. Last week we talked about how we need to stop believing lies. Well, this week, I want to just simply speak from this content, this continual subject of knowing the truth brings freedom. And our subtopic is simply this, be the truth, be the truth. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And I thank you for everyone that's watching by live stream or even those that are watching uh, the playback on Facebook or YouTube or whatever other medium that they find it. Lord, we thank you that you open our eyes and our ears that we might hear what thus saith the Lord in Jesus name. And everyone said, amen. So I want to talk about, <clears throat> and uh, the previous two weeks, we had talked about how there were several lies that we as believers have believed. And I don't know exactly how I'm going to uh, corral all these, but let me just give a couple of them up front. One of the first things we have to be able to do, we got to stop believing the lie that we are insignificant, that we cannot make any impact, we also have to stop believing the lie of uh, disappointment. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But <clears throat> I was watching a video of someone worship a while ago. And as this particular young man began to lead uh, this particular congregation in worship, you could see how the spirit of the Lord was moving very strongly. And my mind went back to, and I'm speaking to you who are in Living River Family Worship Center. My mind went back to some of our early days. And even, um, you, you all know we have a quite a fantastic worship team. And <clears throat> I remember when we first started, uh, we would get criticized about, and we still to this day get criticized about a whole bunch of stuff, but we're going to obey God. But one of the things that I remember people saying was who, and it was mostly spoken out of ignorance. It was mostly spoken out of people who had very small spiritual understanding. And one of the things that they would do, they would criticize our worship. And they would say, all you all do is just sing the same thing over and over and over. 
they didn't really understand about going to different heights in worship. And as I'm watching this video, I noticed that almost 5 million people had watched this video. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to the young man and I'm not taking away anything that uh, happened. And I was thinking to myself, wow, it's amazing how what we were doing almost 20 years ago, people now all of a sudden find in or hip or stylish in the body of Christ. And I remember thinking to myself, maybe we were just before our time. And I heard the spirit of the Lord say something in my heart. And here's what he said. You were not before your time. You were simply mirroring or you were in step or in rhythm with what was happening in heaven. <laughs> and that really encouraged my heart. And I hope that encourages you all at Living River as well, because there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about that. And, and, and y'all can say, man, if you want to, but there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about that we have been doing. We have been the, the certain things we've been teaching for, for, for a while. And, and I'm not saying that I was the only one or people from Living River were the only ones, but it's like for a while, you see, we get to talking about certain things and nobody would talk about that. And then all of a sudden I'd cut on the TV and some famous preachers in the Chicagoland area start talking about this or talking about that. And I'm like, hmm, ain't that something? Or even people in the, in the area. Well, that's something that God wants us to do. And that's not something that we get prideful or stick our neck out about. But he gives revelation for us to begin to release. And as we release it, it begins to permeate the atmosphere. And all of a sudden, people start catching on. We don't get royalty fees for things that the Spirit of God tells us in the body of Christ. Amen. But I began to wonder, now, if we were doing all that and we were mirroring and we were in step with heaven, but it just wasn't embraced by church folk for the most part, what else is it that we've been doing as a body that we need to continue to do and even blaze new trails in. Is this making sense to you all at Living River? If it is, come on and say, man, let me hear you this morning. Well, pastor, you started off, you said, be the truth. Why did you not say, do the truth? I'll tell you why. The reason why I said, be the truth, instead of saying, do the truth, is because you can be actively and physically doing something and be not like what you're doing. I'm going to say that again. You can be actively, physically doing something and not be like what you're doing or what you are portraying that you are. Have you ever had somebody uh, smile in your face and seem so nice? And they're, they're, they're just, oh, yes, and, 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 and all this. And you see through them like a fake $2 bill. And even though it's you see their actions on the outside, you know that who they really are is not lining up with their actions. We don't just need to do the truth. We need to be the truth that we're doing. It shouldn't be two different things. There should be one in the same. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can cometh unto the Father but by me. Truth is not just some principles. Truth is a person. <laughs> it's Jesus. And if we're united in one spirit with him, it shouldn't be there's the truth of God in our life and hear how we really are. No, if we are unified as one spirit with him, one spirit joined together with him, you should not be able to separate us and the truth. Amen. Listen, um, growth, spiritual growth does not come just by hearing, praying or studying. Let me say that again. Spiritual growth does not just come by consistently hearing the word. Yes, it helps. 
Spiritual growth doesn't just come by just you praying. Yes, it helps. Spiritual growth doesn't just come by you studying the word. Oh, absolutely, it helps. But there's a lot of people who hear messages over and over and over and don't apply it to their life. There's a lot of people who, watch this, will pray a whole lot, but they're not applying what they're getting in their life. There's a lot of people that will study other folks under the table, but that truth is not applied in their life. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, Satan is transformed into an angel of light. The Amplified said, masquerades. The Greek says, disguises. Satan is transformed or masquerades or disguises himself as an angel of light. I remember going to uh, my friend up the street. His family would have a Halloween party. This is before we knew differently in our faith. And we would go, and, and my, my brother and myself, we would go every year, every year that they had it. And when they had it, what was the whole thing about? It was dressing up as someone who you are not. Costumes are worn to give the appearance that you're someone else. But you don't need a disguise or an act for who you truly are. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. But as believers, we are light. I'm going to say that again. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, but as believers, we are light. Back up what you're saying, Pastor Hillman. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Listen to this out of the Passion Translation. Once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission is to live as children flooded with his revelation light. We are light. Listen, if we are children of light, then our father must be light. James chapter one, verse 17, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the father of lights. Hmm. Listen to the Passion Translation. Every good and perfect gift comes down through the father of lights who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadow or darkness and is never subject to change. Children ought to demonstrate the characteristics of their parents. If you look at Moses, he went up on the mountain and what happened when he came down? He was shining bright. That's why he ended up taking a veil and putting it over his face. What happened when Jesus went on the mountain and he took Peter, James, and John with him? He, the Bible said he was transfigured before them. That word transfigured means the outward show or, re, or outward, re, outward manifestation of what is on the inside of you. So who Jesus really looked like, all of a sudden they looked at him his raiment, his clothing, he was like lightning. He was shining brighter than the sun. This is how you and I also look in the spirit. We are children of light. Amen. Listen, as children of light, we cannot help but act like and do like the one who is inside of us. Where are you going with this, Pastor? John chapter 14, verse 10, Jesus, they were asking Jesus about these things that he was doing, and here's what he said. It is the Father that dwells in me. He doeth the works. I want every person watching me right now to open your mouth and declare this statement with me. Get yourself ready. And when you say this, don't say, eh, eh, eh. no, I want you to say it 
with some authority and say it with some conviction. Say this with me. Nothing is impossible for, for me with God. Let's say it again. Nothing is impossible for me with God. Come on, say it one more time. Nothing is impossible for me with God. Come on, say this with me too. I can do everything he has called me to do. One more time. I can do everything God has called me to do. I'm going to tell you something, saints. God desires a tremendous move of his spirit to take place throughout this world. But for, but for this to take place, there must be believers who actually believe that this is possible for it to happen. He wants to use the church, not just superstars, not just famous preachers, not just your pastor, not just the one that you think is real spiritual. He wants to use you and I. It is time for full congregational support. My brothers and sisters, I understand that the, 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 a lot of people believe that the pandemic is winding down slowly. But personally, I believe had the church been on its watch and more than just a couple people, I'm talking about the church collectively, we could have rose up in intercession. What is intercession? God's prayer life through us by the Holy Spirit. And we could have partnered with him and this plague would have been stayed a while ago. Listen, saints, hear me. Stop believing. God can use everybody but you. God wants to use you and I. Stop believing the lie that God cannot use you. He can use Abraham. Well, Abraham was the father of faith. Yes, he was. But Abraham also told some lies. Excuse me. What do you mean Abraham told some lies? Think about this. When they passed through one particular uh, uh, part of the land, <clears throat> excuse me, what Abraham did, he tells his wife, now listen, girl, you look good in your age, and they're going to think that you're my wife. So lie for me and tell them when they ask you, you're not my wife, you my sister, so they will not kill me. Now, wives, how do you feel about a husband who won't stick up for you, who won't stand up for you? He said, listen, we're going to comply with whatever they say, but just don't tell them you my wife so I don't get killed. Think of the selfishness of that. Amen. So God had to stand up and defend the man's wife and tell uh, 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 the king, listen, uh, Abimelech, I like the way Benny Hinn said, Abimelech. <laughs> he had to tell Abimelech, listen, you touch this woman, you but a dead man. And he said, Lord, I haven't laid a hand on him. He said, that's somebody else's wife. And Abimelech came and said, listen, man, you almost got me in trouble with God because you told me this was your sister. Abraham lied. But God yet used him. David, my Lord, you know the issues that David had. He didn't just fool with the man's wife, but had the man's wife husband killed, had him murdered, set him up. God still used him. Well, uh, you, 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 you just don't understand. Let, let me tell you something. Nothing you have done is so bad that has disqualified you to be used by God. But if you continue to allow unbelief to reign in your heart, it will steal your inheritance. Say this with me. I am not insignificant. Come on, say it again. And I want you to say it till you believe it. I am not insignificant. You are not insignificant. Do not underestimate your role, your gifting, and your ability and your influence. I'm going to say it again. Do not underestimate your role in God's grand plan 
of how he wants to turn this world around. Do not underestimate your gifting and ability. Do not underestimate even your influence. I can't remember the woman's name, but I was watching um, <clears throat> a program recently and there's a well-known pastor in a Southern state and he was saying how <clears throat> there was this particular uh, uh, woman and she was an evangelist, really, she was an apostle. But what happened was he knew that God really used her in dreams and visions, but he wasn't quite, he didn't quite know the depth of how the Lord used her. And one day he was uh, out in the field and the Lord kept speaking her name. And he was like, who is this woman? So he began to ask around and he found her by the spirit. I can't remember her name, but this was back in the 40s and 50s. This woman would go by herself. She'd have a truck and she would pack up a, a big tent, a tent big enough where it could seat a couple thousand people. She would pack up her tent and she'd pack a shotgun. She would pack up this tent and pack a shotgun, I mean, and, and a shotgun, and God would speak to her in the evening and give her a dream and say, I want you to go over here to Texas. I want you to go over here to Arkansas. I want you to go over here to Kentucky. And God would tell her where to go. At one particular place, this lady, she would pray and seek God, and God would tell her where to go. She pulls up to this farmer's field in Texas, and she's explains what she does. And she says, would you mind if I set this up in your, in your field? He said, you can go ahead and do it, but ain't nobody going to come. And she would put up her tent and she would have nothing to live on, but she would hunt squirrels and different varmints throughout uh, uh, the land. And she would fry them up in her frying pan. And she would put up a tent that would seat over a couple thousand people. And maybe the first night, maybe two or three would come. Then next thing you know, within a couple of days, you have a little bit more and you have a little bit more. But without fail, this is back in the 40s and the 50s. By the time the week was up, there were over a couple thousand people throughout her tent. This woman ended up planting over 75 churches that are still in the Assemblies of God organization today. Saints, come on, somebody back in the 40s and the 50s, and you know how they felt about female preachers back then? Don't tell me something is impossible with God. Do not underestimate how God can use you. Will he use you the same as that woman? Probably not. But there is a way God wants to use you that he created you for that you must fulfill. Someone say amen. You know, <clears throat> even in our local church, I'll give you an example. Never underestimate your role. In our church, we have several praying people. <clears throat> and there are, there are some men and women who really know how to get a hold of God. And there are certain ones in the church that especially when they come to me and they have that look in their eye, I can tell when they believe they've heard something from God. And one sister, it was actually Sister Renee. And if you ask her, you, you, uh, you can bring it up to her and she'll remember giving me this word. She said, Pastor, <clears throat> and she prophesied this to me for maybe, I don't know, almost a year it seemed like. And this was maybe three years ago, about two or three years ago. And she kept telling me, I see all these men sitting around. She said, I see you mentoring all these men. Well, when she first told me that, I was like, okay, we, we really do got to uh, improve certain things with the men's ministry and this, this, that, or the other. But I would keep praying about it. But I kept feeling like, no, oh, that's for somebody else in the church to do. And I'm like, Lord, what about this word? So, Anyway, I kept seeking the Lord. Make a long story short, I ended up meeting some people. And I ended up partnering my personal ministry, not my church ministry, but my personal ministry, 
excuse me, with another ministry nonprofit in the area. And they do a lot as far as working with the homeless. And in addition to that, one of the main things that I do is help men who have been uh, recovering, who are in recovery from drugs and alcohol. Saints, in less than two years time, I have been able to have the privilege of touching the lives of probably, I'd probably say about a thousand people at least. But the thing that really stands out is I've personally been able to spend time and mentor hundreds of men. Some of them are no longer living. Some of them have incredible testimonies of deliverance, how God has brought them off of drugs and alcohol. And some of them, I believe God had me in their life just before they transitioned from this life into the next. But the point that I'm making is this was a life changing word that was pretty major in my life at the time because it really helped present a different paradigm for what ministry really is and how we're going forward, even as a church body. And I imagine that when she gave me that word, she probably didn't even realize it was even going to be that significant. But it is. Amen. That one word literally changed the lives of hundreds of men. Saints, God wants to use each and every one of you. You are not insignificant. Amen. Listen, God did not call your pastor to reach people in your sphere of influence. He called you. I'm going to say that again. God did not call your pastor to reach people in your sphere of influence. He called you. So many times I remember, even as a young minister, I would meet different people and I would think to myself, boy, I got to introduce them to Bishop Davis. I got to introduce them to my pastor because when they meet my pastor, he'll be able to really help enlighten them. No, it was my job to reach them because they were in my sphere of influence. And all that word that the bishop had been laboring and giving me all those years, I was to use not just on myself, but to impact the people that God has given me access into their lives. Can someone say amen? Listen to Ephesians chapter four, verse 16, out of the Passion Translation. For his body has been formed in his image and is, jo and is closed closely jointly together and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate and effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. King James says it like this, every joint supplies, every joint, every member of the body contributes, not just one or two people. You look in most churches, it's, it's, they, they call it the, 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 the 20% rule. They say 20% of people in most churches do the most giving, do the most work, do the most praying, do the most evangelizing, do the most teaching, do the most witnessing. No, God created a whole entire body. And when the entire body, one of the reasons why we have not experienced a full move of the spirit is because we have not yet had the full body participate. My God, listen, Nehemiah had every member, had, had each family Remember when Nehemiah rebuilt the wall around, around Jerusalem? Listen to this. Nehemiah had each family rebuild a section of the wall by their house. That's important. Here's why. By working on the wall by their house, the quality of it was better if they would have worked on another's. It's one thing for you to work on the wall by your house. It's another thing for you to work on the wall down the street by Brother So-and-So's house because the craftsmanship that you may use at Brother So-and-So's house 
may not be the same as you would use on your own. Because I tell you what, I guarantee you, you working on a wall by your house, you're going to make sure the nail's in there just right. You're going to make sure ain't going to be no leaking. Oh, no. You're going to make sure you measure twice before you cut once. Yes, you will. You're going to make sure that it's built right by your house. <laughs> but listen, God has called us to give ourselves to the work he's called us to do. Don't worry about how somebody else is building. Don't worry about how somebody else's work looks. Stop looking at other people and saying, this person is more spiritual than me. I can never pray like them. I can never preach like them. I can never teach like them. I can never witness like them. I can never set it up or run a committee like them. Who cares? Do what God wants you to do. The one who is anointed to do the work that God gave you is you. Now, let me go ahead and finish this up. And, I, and here's the last thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about overcoming the lie and the deception of disappointment. Overcoming the lie and the deception of disappointment. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 27, Elisha <clears throat> had told a woman that she was going to give birth to a son. And when he told her that, she was like, don't, don't, don't disappoint me now. Don't, don't, don't tell me this and you don't really mean this. Don't give me a word that's not really from God because I've been disappointed before. I don't want to go through this again because she had no child. Watch this. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 27, King James Version, it says, So she said, because now her son that she had given birth to had, had basically uh, died. Some believe he had an aneurysm and he died. Listen. She, so she said, Desi Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I say, do not deceive me? So... Elisha hears this. He sends Gehazi. He tells him, take his staff, lay it on the child, see if the child come back to life. Gehazi did it, nothing happened. So later on, Elisha comes and he stretches out over the child. You know the verse. But listen to this. Physical pain can be terrible. But there is no pill for emotional pain. Proverbs chapter 27 uh, verse 22 out of the New Living Translation says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. When we experience continual disappointment in our lives, it becomes like a cloud over the lens of our heart. And it affects our perception. It distorts how we see. It changes how we interpret everything around us. Years ago, I had a friend who he was dating a girl and she ended up two timing him and it hurt him real bad. And it changed his outlook on women. And it caused him basically to objectify women. It caused him not to trust him. It caused him to be very, very, very negative towards them. But what he was doing, he was thinking every woman, they're, 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 they just cannot be trusted. But what happened, it was the stain from, from the one that he used to date that was clouding how he saw everyone else. Until we remove the veil or the cloud over our hearts, we will fail to become everything God has destined us to be. We can bring all these jaw-breaking revelations. We can pray 10 hours a day. You can have all these incredible signs and wonders and whatever demonstrated in front of you. won't matter. Until that disappointment over the lens of your heart 
is dealt with, you're not going to be able to be the fullness of what God has designed for you to do. What cloud has been over your heart? <laughs> Someone said, they've been hurt in church. Who hasn't? You ain't really been in it till you've been hurt in it. And truth be told, you really didn't get hurt by the church. You got hurt by people. And in many cases, the people who hurt you will probably hurt themselves. Well, uh, uh, I'm upset with the Lord. I prayed and the prayer request didn't go like I wanted. You heard me talk about a lot of these men that I had to de that I've been dealing with. And in many cases, the addiction is not the problem. The addiction to heroin, the addiction to cocaine, the addiction to alcohol is not really the issue. It's trauma that they express that they that they had when they were kids from maybe their father <clears throat> beating up their mother and knocking them around and telling them that they weren't going to be worth two dead flies. So now when they hear about how God is a good, good father and people in church getting excited about that, they hearing this and they're like, good, good father. Uh, uh, I will not have nothing to do with a father because the only thing I know about a father is that he beat me silly. Got to deal with the issue behind the fruit. When Gehazi went and laid his staff on that child, nothing happened. It did not revive him. We do not need more prophetic words from more empty vessels that cannot produce results. Saints, hear me and hear me good. And I say this not from a standpoint of pride, but as a spiritual father. Stop listening to every preacher. Stop listening to every evangelist. Stop listening to every prophet. Oh my goodness. And, and, and some of these words that have gone forth in some of these teaching, it's ruined people's lives. It's time to turn back to the Lord and stop looking so much to man. Listen, Elisha came and he stretched himself upon the child and the child started to become warm. He got up and walked around and prayed some more. And he went and he stretched over him again and he sneezed seven times. Hear me, hear me good. You may have been disappointed by whatever, but I have news for you. The Spirit of God wants to stretch himself out over you again. He wants to touch you again. The breath of his Spirit wants to come and fill you and touch you afresh if you'll allow him. I'm going to close this up, but uh, I got to testify about me. I didn't even realize to the extent that disappointment had affected me, saints. Listen, I had to repent because without totally realizing it, I had allowed so many disappointments to cloud my heart. And I wasn't quite totally cognizant that I was doing it. I just thought I was doing a good, safe thing. Listen, I was beginning to find myself not just frustrated, but I found myself settling for less than what I knew God had called me to. And you wanna know why? Because of my disappointments. Now watch me and follow me real good. My disappointments 
I thought that they were really in God. And it caused me to maybe pull back some. But my disappointment really wasn't in God. My disappointment was in people. And so I started looking more at what people were doing instead of looking to what God was doing. Because the Bible is true. God never fails. As for the Lord, his way is perfect. Let me tell you something. If you ask God for something and he say no, he still answered you. And there was a reason why he said that. Listen. When I start focusing my trust more on people and less on God, I start finding my expectation start diminishing. And it start becoming measurable. You know why? Because I didn't want to get disappointed again. I didn't want to put myself out there and then all of a sudden the lies of the devil start coming. You know what happened when you tried to do this before? You know what happened when you tried to step out in faith? This didn't happen like you thought it was going to happen. People didn't do this. People didn't do that. And so now all of a sudden, I start perceiving, my spirit is perceiving, the Lord wants me to go this way and do this. But all of a sudden, I'm finding myself coming up with reasons to analyze and talk myself out of what it is that the Spirit of God is saying because I didn't want to be disappointed anymore. No one to keep it measurable. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You come to a point, you don't, you, especially you get to a certain age, you don't want to experience certain things anymore. You, 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 you don't want to come to a certain age and fail at this or feel like you're not a cop. There's certain things you want. Am I the only one? We can come to the place where we limit God. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58 says this. And he did not mighty works because of their unbelief. Jesus came to his hometown. Now, every other city he's gone, incredible things were happening. But when he came to Capernaum, he couldn't do the spectacular. You want to know why? Because of their unbelief. Oh, that's just Joseph's boy. You remember, they grew up down that street over there. We know him. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. You remember his mama Mary, Joseph? Joseph was the one that built that table for us. And the expectation got diminished. I'm going to close with one more example. Is this ministering to your heart? Have you allowed the cloud of disappointment to hinder and distort what it is God wants you to clearly see? The plan that he has for your life? Or maybe you say, well, I feel like I can't hear the Lord the same way. Well, maybe it's because you need to check and you need to check the filter. You know, some people, especially when we had this cold snap in Chicago, they were wondering why their heat wasn't putting out the way that it was supposed to put out because they hadn't changed their filter in 12 months. You got to change the filter. One more thing, and, and, and I'm closing. <clears throat> the, the ministry that I've been uh, partnering with and working, working aside, working alongside of, In the particular area of, of these men that I've been working with, I start noticing the numbers start getting low. And some of those I was working with, they were like, wow, you know, it'd be awesome if we could pray and uh, the Lord would send some more people. So here's what I did privately. I went off by myself, nobody around. 
And I sat there and I just got quiet before the Lord. And I asked him, Lord, please send me five men that really need our help. And send them here quickly, Lord. As the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior and King, lives in less than two weeks, guess how many came? Now, that's not the story. Listen, of those five, this was maybe over a month ago, of those five, guess how many are still there? that I prayed for. I got a little disappointed in that. I'm like, Lord, I asked for five. You sent five, but they didn't stay. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me what the word says. Remember the, the story of the, of the parable? The source of the word? Some seed went out by the wayside. Fowls came, devoured it up. Some was sown on uh, 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 stony ground. And it went down. They got excited for a while. But then it hit that stone and it, the roots sprang up. Then it hit thorny ground, the cares of this world. It choked, it grew up, but then it choked the word. But then there was the word that was sown on 30, 60, and 104, which was good ground. Now, one out of the four, 25%, that's pretty good. Here's what I'm getting at, saints. When I prayed and I asked God to send me five, he sent the five. He did his part. They made the choice to do something different. But watch this. I should have went back <laughs> because the same God who could send five can send 50. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? I got disappointed because and I start looking at what the people did instead of focusing on how faithful God is to fulfill his word. Do you understand that? This is what we need to do. Take your focus off of people. Stop trusting in people. The Bible says it's foolish to trust in the arm of flesh. It's time to put our trust and our faith back in the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray right now. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can trust in you. Lord, we lift up our hearts and we ask you, Holy Spirit, every area where there has been a cloud over our heart, expose it. Lord, we repent now and we give you full permission to deal with us so that this can be removed and we choose to forgive Everyone who has done us wrong, whether we feel it or not, because your word declares that if we don't forgive others, you will not forgive us. And so, Lord, it don't require any feeling for us to forgive. We forgive by faith, by an act of our will, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah for just touching everyone under the sound of my voice and everyone watching now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And for every person that is facing any sickness or disease right now, Lord, I come against that pain. You foul living form of corruption called sickness and disease, I curse you now. And I command you to disintegrate. I'm looking at arthritis in somebody's hands. 
I'm looking at arthritis in somebody's hands. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, I've seen you straighten out legs. I've seen you heal backs and set bones right. Lord, I thank you now. I speak to those hands and I command those bones. Yes, there it is. I command those bones to be set right and straightened in the name of Jesus. I don't know who you are, but I want you to send us a message because I want to hear about this miracle that the Lord is doing for you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for the angel of the Lord that stands right by you now in Jesus' name, from the crown of your head down to the sole of your feet. Every autoimmune disease I curse now in the name of Jesus. Every respiratory problem, I speak peace and life and strength to your body. Hey, shundo, hallelujah, glory to God. And I give your name praise, hallelujah. The person that's been having all that pain with these headaches, and it feels like there's like a long needle that's being pressed into your skull. I command it to loose now in Jesus' name. Eh, frando oste kalalao se waande sandala la bohoshe. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you and I thank you, Lord. Oh, glory to God. Lord, the person that's been having issues with their back, I speak to that spine now and I command it to be straightened in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for the surging of your healing power. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's someone else watching me. Hallelujah. You even, and just to show you who you are, you're not even sure about all this. You haven't seen anything like this before, but you keep having an issue where you have problems, where the bleeding goes constantly on and on and on. There's someone in the Bible that was just like you, but I'm telling you, even though it was a total different situation, it was the same circumstance, but to show you that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. That bleeding ceases now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we praise you and we thank you now in Jesus' mighty name. Listen, saints, God is good. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We would love to hear your comments about all the things that God has done for you and how this word has encouraged you. You can send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a blessing unto the ministry and continuing to watch us in this live stream as we yet move closer to when we can be back uh, with each other physically in service. Amen. But we thank God for the medium it is to communicate with you now. Hallelujah. Saints, I just feel the presence of the Lord so strong. Wherever you are, I just dare you lift up your hands and just begin to worship him now. Come on and cry out and glorify him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that everyone watching, Lord, let your spirit permeate every room. Glory to God. Let your, let your peace begin to fall. Your abundant joy begin to flow. Lord, Father, I thank you for that joy unspeakable. Out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Let it begin to flow now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Y'all enjoy the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. Glory to God.